The day's case takes place in South Africa, it's a country of contrasts with great natural beauty and cultural diversity, but also economic imbalance and a high murder rate. Indeed South Africa has the fifth highest murder rate in the world, the murder rate is 33 murders per 100,000 people, while the global average is 6, and in Europe it's under 2. But Injilitz wasn't born in a dangerous place in March 9, 1983, Inji was born in Pretoria, and she was the daughter of an affluent couple Juanita, a physiotherapist. And Jan a radiology professor Jan and Juanita had tried to have children for a full decade before Juanita became pregnant with Inga when their daughter came along. They made her the number one priority they supported her every single day, making sure she achieved her dreams and always aimed higher and just like her parents. She did aim high she was a straight-A student who always made plans for her future and got excited about a career after receiving a bachelor's degree in actuarial science. Inga went on to start a master's program in mathematical statistics at the University of Stellenbosch, so she now lived in Stellenbosch, a luxurious city. Not far away from Cape Town known for its rich history food and wine culture and buzzing nightlight Inji lived by herself in a high-security apartment. Relationship with her parents was so close that she would call Juanita every single morning to chat and let her know she woke up and was heading to school. It was their little tradition they loved each other deeply Inge wasn't one of the students who wandered out alone at night or even spent her nights out at friends' houses. In fact she was very careful about her safety she chose her apartment due to its high security standards, including tall walls with electric wire and a remote control gate. As the complex was still in the process of construction she didn't even move into her flat until they had the secure gate installed South Africa not only has a very high murder rate. But a nasty track record when it comes to violence against women, Inji knew this she made sure her home university and social life were safe, that is what makes this case so creepy. In November 2004 Inga started dating a fellow student named Fred Van de Veyer. he was also a top student, having just received a bachelor's degree and working at a prominent insurance firm in Cape Town, Fred was the youngest of three boys born to a rich farming family she was just as ambitious as Inga. And this seemed to bring them together, Fred was also a devotee of his people's church. Much like Inga's parents this is a branch of the Christian church and its devotees are very strict about before marriage, in fact Fred was so strict he wanted almost no physical contact with Inga. He believed that any such contact is a temptation that would lead to sex, although Inga's parents also attended church services she wasn't raised as fundamental as Fred. So this created some negative friction between them, although they were only together for a few months, Fred had become quite possessive of his girlfriend. He was often accusing her that she doesn't love him anymore or that she was not committed enough Inji was initially enthusiastic about their relationship. They had even talked about marriage, but as February turned to March, she was having second thoughts on March 16th Inji went to lunch with a friend. And told her she believed their relationship was over they had just had a pretty nasty fight and she didn't think she could move past that after all if it had gotten this nasty in just five months. Imagine how it could get after years and years it was a tough decision, but it was the right thing to do as far as Inga was concerned, except that night she never got to break up with Fred. She was butchered to death inside her own high security apartment. At around 9pm on March 16, 2005, Fred was trying to get a hold of Inga, but she didn't respond to his calls or text strange, she always had her phone close by, so Fred called Juanita. She would speak to her daughter at least once a day, so she had to know where she was Juanita said she'd spoken to Inga around lunchtime that day she suggested that. Maybe she'd silenced her phone so that she could study, but Fred didn't believe this to be true at 10.18 pm, he sent one last text message to his girlfriend from his own Cape Town home. Then he told his roommate and friend Marius that he would drive over to Inga's to see what was going on, but it was a 40-minute drive to Inga's apartment and Marius thought of a better option. They called their mutual friend Christo who also lived in Stellenbach a few minutes away from Inga, they asked him to quickly check in on her while Fred drove over to her parents. Crystal arrived at Inge's door at 10.30pm and rang her intercom, but she wasn't answering Christo asked the neighbor to buzz him in, so he went over to her door and knocked for a few minutes on end. No matter how hard he was hitting her door and Inga wasn't opening it something was off before heading out, Christo noticed the lights inside the apartment were all off, but the television was on. Then when he tried the door it was unlocked as soon as he opened the door he saw her Inga was lying in a strange position on the couch, as if she'd fallen asleep. After a wild night but there was nothing wild about this she was covered in blood her face was unrecognizable, she was still holding the remote control for the TV and a magazine was lying at her feet. Christo couldn't even step closer he ran away and knocked on the door of the neighbor who had buzzed him in earlier he urged them to call the emergency services. The neighbor would speak to the police, while Christo notified Fred it would be a hard call he knew his friend was in love with Inji and wanted to marry her. 
when the detectives arrived on the scene they met Christo. He was deeply shaken and behaved quite strangely, but considering how gruesome the crime scene was the police officers. Thought nothing of it Inga had been be bludgeoned to death with a blunt object, most likely a hammer her head was smashed, and her neck had multiple stick wounds, she'd been struck 47 times it. Wasn't just her murder it was a frenzied attack her sink had been used by the killer to wash their hands, the bloody towel they used was left on the floor carelessly there was just one print. Inside her bathroom a bloody shoe print who could have wanted Inga dead so badly as far as her family knew she had no enemies and there was no way a stranger could have entered her apartment complex since there was no sign of breaking and entering or any ransacking inside to home the police. Figured the attacker would have been close to Inga she probably even let them in. Willingly the only missing objects were a large kitchen knife and the small remote that operated the gate outside on Inga's coffee table was a DVD open cover. The Stepford wives had just finished playing on the TV and the menu was still on the detectives started their murder investigation by tracking down in Inga's movements that week. Inga's parents were barely able to speak imagine learning that your only child has been brutally murdered inside an apartment she sought out for its excellent security. But they did reveal a bit of worrying information from the previous week on March 11th, Inga was visiting Jan and Juanita's home when Juanita noticed she had bruises on her arm. Juanita didn't say anything at first, but Inga noticed her looking, so she went to her childhood room and changed her clothing her mother knew she was hiding something two days later Fred. Wanted to come visit Inga at her parents' place, but Inga didn't agree she wanted to hang out with her family by herself, still Fred turned up uninvited. The Lot's family was too polite to send him packing, so they spent an awkward evening together on March 15 Fred spent the night at Inga's place you. Wouldn't think anything of this if they were a regular young couple, but Fred was a devotee of his people's church, he didn't want any physical contact act with Inga. So spending the night together was a pretty unusual event for the two of them that night Fred was upset he told Inga he was angry at his brother, but Inga wondered. If he wasn't actually upset with their relationship he had become increasingly demanding and possessive over the last few weeks she confessed to Fred. That she wasn't sure about their future together anymore she asked him if he still loved her, Fred said he did, but he didn't believe she loved him anymore. It seemed like neither trusted the other it was an issue that Inga didn't think they could solve that night, the couple had a huge fight early. The next morning Fred asked Inga to write her feelings in a letter to him, something he could mull over for the next few days, then he drove over to his college campus in Cape Town. He was taking morning courses before work by 10 a.m., she had written a two-page letter she couldn't wait to take it over to Fred and get this over with she was a problem solver. And didn't want any drama in her life, but just as she was heading out a contractor arrived when Inga had moved into her apartment, the movers brought her large sofa inside via the balcony. Several tiles were broken in the process, so now a contractor had arrived to replace the tiles, but Inga asked the contractor to return to her apartment in the afternoon as she was just leaving. He agreed and they left Inga drove to Fred's college campus and handed him the letter she headed her way and Fred drove over to a furniture store to pick up something for his friend before heading to his office at noon, Inga had lunch with her childhood friend Wimpy, this was when she told him all about her and Fred's awful fight. The previous night she wasn't sure of their relationship anymore and in fact she believed it was best if they broke up at 1.15pm she arrived back home. The contractors were already waiting outside so she let them in, and they completed the work just around the time they were leaving Inga was on the phone chatting with Juanita. So Juanita heard the contractors leave, and Inga locked the door and the security gate behind them, so the contractors were removed from the suspect pool. Inga wished her mom a great day and hung up, and that was the last time Juanita spoke to her daughter at 1.36pm Inga also sent her last text to Fred had a nice visit with Wimpy. Tiles have been laid miss you already an hour later she bought a Steers hamburger soda and a magazine, then she walked over to a video rental store close by. And rented the 2004 movie The Stepford Wives, she would watch it that evening, as she was brutally killed by 4pm, she was wearing pajama shorts by 8 o'clock. You might think okay seems like Fred is a person of interest he was a possessive boyfriend and he had felt Inga pull away from him, but he'd been at work that whole day. And he however when the detectives canvassed the crime scene back at Inga's place, they pulled one fingerprint off the DVD cover of the Stepford Wives. And indeed the fingerprint would match friends. The case of Ingelitz made headlines throughout South Africa, that very evening murder cases might be above average in South Africa, but a young top student from a wealthy family getting butchered inside. Her home is simply something that made no sense to anyone Inga's boyfriend's face was shown next to hers in virtually all newspapers, some articles wondered if he had anything to do with her death. But Fred's behavior said otherwise as soon as he heard the news he moved into Jan and Juanita's home, he slept on a mattress in the living room and had turned the room into a shrine to Inga. Inga's parents seemed to be comforted by Fred and they offered him closure in return on the day before Inga's funeral, Juanita wrote to Fred thank you. 
for all of your love fret our hearts have been broken by our angel child love you sleep well, but before long their relationship became strained a few days. Later Jan and Juanita would kick Fred out of their home meanwhile the police were slowly piecing together a worrying puzzle on the day of Inga's death, someone had cut the power. At the security gate while electricians were working to install the fan in a garbage room, there were lots of people in the apartment complex that day or the usual residents on the one hand. There were Inca's contractors at least two men on the other hand there was a large construction team remember a part of the complex was still under construction. But apartment and Juanita had heard the contractors leave they weren't the main suspects the detectives looked at the man in Inga's life her childhood friend. Wimpy her ex-boyfriend Brom Kruger Fred's roommate Marius and of course Fred himself, Fred was the no-brainer suspect for the police, but his alibi was more than solid he'd been at work. From 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. that day, and several people had seen him at meetings throughout the day, there was even CCTV footage showing Fred entering and leaving his office. Building the footage didn't show Fred leaving at any point during his workday the detectives went on to interrogate Wimpy and Brom, they were both cleared of suspicion within hours. But when the investigators turned their eyes to Marius, they became a bit more suspicious the main problem was that Maria said he'd been in his Cape Town apartment. Throughout March 16, but there was no one to corroborate his story, then there was another clue Marius had been in love with Inga during their first university year. Although she rejected his advances Marius had written a huge love letter to her, Inga's friends described the letter as a meter long Marius's interest in and guys seemed to fade especially. As his roommate started dating her, but did it really fade, or did he just have to hide his feelings for fear of causing a conflict with his friend, the police kept a close eye on Marius. But they couldn't charge him there was zero evidence linking him to the crime scene, and being alone at home on the day of a murder doesn't make you guilty just as. The detectives were grasping at straws the case got suddenly more complicated, two weeks after Inga's death, a 17-year-old boy named Wenner Carlos came forward and said he was there when Inga died, then he said he had actually killed her while he was high, that conversation was confusing to say the least, what made the officers believe his creepy story was. The fact that he knew Inga died on the couch this detail had not been made public yet. Wenner was a local drug dealer, but it was clear he had consumed a fair amount himself, every time he would speak to the police, his story would change one time he said he killed Deng. Then he said he witnessed her attack, then he said he just found her there, then he was adamant the attack happened on a Saturday when March 16th was a Wednesday he confessed. The being high at the time so the detectives really didn't know what to think the detectives asked him to take them to Inga's apartment, he took them over to the apartment complex. But he didn't know which door was hers the detectives lost interest in winter after a while, and the main reason for this is that they truly believed Fred was involved, no matter how strong his alibi was. The story of March 2005 was very clearly pointing at Fred Inga's relationship with him was more and more ridden with fights and on the night before her death. Inga told Fred she didn't think he loved her anymore, she confessed she was having doubts about their future when the police got their hands on the letters she'd written to Fred on the morning. Of March 16 they also discovered lots of loving words she still cared for him deeply and seemed to want to work things out if anything she seemed apologetic I am really sorry. About some of the things I said this morning my biggest mistake over recent times must have been to find my security, but when the detective spoke to Wimpy who'd had lunch with Inga that day. He painted a different picture that morning they'd had a hell of a fight, something she wasn't sure they could recover from Inga's parents were also questioned about Fred Jan said. He had his doubts about Fred from the get-go he seemed manipulative and controlling from the very first weeks Juanita also mentioned seeing bruises on her daughter's arm just days. Before her awful death since she hid those under a long sleeve top, she she realized Engage wasn't ready to talk about it just yet, but Juanita had also heard her fight with Fred over the phone. While she was at their home this was on the same day that Fred turned up uninvited at the lot, says when he noticed her wearing a short summer dress for an evening event. He told her she must only wear this kind of revealing clothing when she is with him then of course the police spoke to Fred himself, that's when they started noticing inconsistencies in his story. When they first spoke to Fred the detectives asked where he was when he found out Inga was dead, he said he was inside Jan and Juanita's home, but Jan. And Juanita said they found him outside their home in his car at that time, when Juanita asked Fred to show her the letter Inga had written him that morning he refused, saying it was personal. However he pointed out that it was a love letter was he hiding that there were issues between them, or did he genuinely believe Inga had written him a love letter, then Fred didn't even. Stranger thing he handed Juanita a small piece of paper with a handwritten text on it and claimed it was Inga's last letter to him at Red. I just want to say I appreciate how special you are thank you for your love support and kind heart and that you are always prepared to listen to my little problems I love you very 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 much. Good luck with your day and your week can know that Jesus is always with you, Inga knew this was not her last letter to Fred, they knew the context she'd written at the fight. 
they'd had that morning so this made no sense why was Fred lying to them, then there was another clash between them at the Undertaker's, Juanita's brother was supposed to come to the morgue and identify Inga's body, but before he could make it Fred had two other pastors take care of the job he acted like he did the family a favor, but once again it seemed like he was hiding something. Finally weeks after Inge's murder, the last piece was added to the, the puzzle the results came back from the lab, and a fingerprint found on Inga's DVD cover matched Fred remember how Inga had only bought the DVD on the afternoon of March 16, this means that Fred was at the crime scene way before the workday ended, this creepy clue was enough for the police to get a search warrant for Fred's home inside Fred's Cape Town apartment, the detectives found a recently washed sports shoe, and guess what the shoe matched the bloody print found. Inside Inga's bathroom the investigators then asked Fred if he owned a hammer, and he pointed them towards his ornamental hammer the hammer actually worked as a bottle opener. And creepily enough it was a Christmas present from Inga's parents, the police found his hammer under the front seat of his car, so the officers had another look at the record of Fred's day on. March 16 at 11 a.m. Fred arrived at work and joined his colleagues for a morning workshop at 1.10 p.m., he logged into a computer and wrote to Inga, thanking her for the letter, but it all becomes a little weirder after 3.30 p.m. There is zero activity for two hours, both on Fred's phone and computer, also none of his colleagues could confirm he was at the office during those hours. What about the CCTV footage showing him only arriving at 11 a.m. and leaving at 6 p.m.? Well, the police figured he could have left via the company's car park which has no surveillance cameras. In June 2005 Fred handed himself to the police, but he only did so because his lawyer advised him to the police were getting close to a warrant for his arrest, so Fred played. The innocent card he told the police he had nothing to hide and even offered to take a polygraph test to prove he was innocent, he passed the test and was smug about his freedom. But by now the police had enough evidence to charge him with first-degree murder, but it wasn't until February 2007 almost two years after Inga's murder that Fred's trial started. And it would be one of South Africa's longest most expensive and highly publicized trials, Fred's trial lasted for nine whole months, his family sold their farm to afford his defense. Needless to say he needed the country's most expensive lawyers to get him out of this, the prosecution made their case quite clear his fingerprint was on the DVD cover. But Chinga had only rented out hours before the murder, this means that Fred was at her place on the afternoon of March 16, when he claimed he was at work, but Fred's family had a counter attack prepared they hired Pat Wertheim, an American fingerprint expert Wertheim, and forensics expert Dr. David Cladso, testified that the fingerprint had actually been lifted from a cylindrical surface such as glass definitely not a flat surface like a DVD cover number one, he didn't label the fingers you always label the fingerprint that you pick up at the scene. Of the crumb with the time the place the date and the surface on which you pick it up he didn't do that and those were only labeled sometimes quite a quite a significant time after the event. When the exact memory of what had happened and how you lifted the mat could faded so by this stage, now the fingerprint was under serious serious attack, the net result of that was that the police then took it back for a second look to some of their fingerprint experts in Pretoria, who agreed with the defense, saying that the fingerprint was in fact not lifted from the DVD, but lifted from a glass if that was true, it meant that Fred was framed by the police sadly, the police couldn't prove this, they had returned the DVD to the rental store I know face palm moment right there. The police had made a plethora of mistakes during the investigation, when the emergency services were first called to the scene, seven officers walked around Inga's apartment, compromising vital evidence. Then the police didn't get any statements from the workers and contractors who were at the apartment complex on that day, when this was pointed out it was too late. The construction company had been dissolved, and the illegal workers were impossible to trace the police also never mentioned winner to the defense, remember the 17-year-old dealer who had made a series of creepy confessions, why was he pushed to the side completely when the prosecution's fingerprint argument failed, they turned to the two hours. That Fred's colleagues couldn't account for while it was around 105 minutes total, and the defense argued that he couldn't make two 40-minute drives attack Inga and clean himself up so perfectly in such a short amount of time, some of Fred's colleagues also testified to him, appearing perfectly calm and normal in the evening. When the prosecution pointed to the letter Inga had written Fred and how he'd hidden the letter from her parents, Fred turned it in his favor he said he'd hidden it. Because he cared about Inga's parents, and Inga had mentioned her father's drinking, so Fred didn't want him to feel upset about this, what about the bloody shoe print here's? Where it gets outrageous the very expert who matched the print to Fred's shoe then came to court and retracted his statement he said the match isn't exact. And that the print might not even be a shoe print after all had Fred's family bribed him so well he forgot about justice, the final piece of evidence would have been the hammer, but no blood. Marks were found on it, and the defense team argued that the hammer didn't match the size of Inga's wounds in November 2007, Fred was acquitted of all charges. 
The judge commented that he had never seen such an amount of police incompetence and it is because of this, we may never get the full story behind Inga's horrible death. The Lotzes filed a civil lawsuit against Fred citing emotional damage, but in May 2009, they dropped the lawsuit the following year Fred won a lawsuit against the police for $2 million. Three years later the Supreme Court overturned this it might have been a small victory for the Watts family, but according to Juanita, her pain never left and never will when Inga died. My soul died almost two decades later people are still debating and discussing the case, hoping to get the answers that the South African justice system. Never could recently there has been a petition to reopen Inga's case, but it never got enough signatures to pass, did Inga's brutal death come at the hands of an angered possessive boyfriend? Did winner have anything to do with it and did corruption interfere with justice, what do you guys think about this case, let me know down in the comments section. And before you go don't forget to like subscribe and click that bell button so you never miss another episode see you next time and stay safe.